All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully you are here today because you are wanting to better your analysis skills in Tableau. And you're here to learn about uh, averages here today by Paul Albert. Uh, my name is Debbie Yu. I'm an analytics consultant with Interworks. Uh, what that means is I help people make sense of their data. Uh, by whether it's teaching one of four different Tableau courses um, at sort of a, a public site or with clients. I also help uh, clients on site with whatever data or dashboarding issues they might come across. Um, I'm with a company called Interworks. Uh, Interworks is hosting and we are a co-sponsor of the Tableau DMV meetup group. Uh, you might have noticed myself or some of my colleagues at some of our previous meetup group events. Uh, Interworks is a Tableau partner. Uh, we've been working really closely with Tableau for almost 10 years now, and uh, we are a global business intelligence consulting firm. So all that really means is if you have a data or Tableau challenge, we can help you. Chances are if you have tried to do some Googling for a, a solution to a Tableau question, you may have come across our blog. On our blog, we post lots of different articles about Tableau tips and tricks. Uh, we also post different articles about data, and we have a little podcast. So say check out our blog for lots of really useful resources there about Tableau or data. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of uh, listening to Mr. Paul Albert present to us about averages and analysis in Tableau. Uh, Paul has had a really extensive career in the technology and software industry from some of the uh, companies that you'll easily recognize like Oracle or Gartner and, of course, Tableau. Uh, Paul also teaches courses at George Mason University right now on how to do analysis uh, in Tableau. And so I'd like to take it away to Paul uh, to go ahead and uh, kick us off. Thanks so much, Debbie. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Oh, and while you're doing that, uh, one quick thing I want to add for the attendees is that if you have any questions along the way, uh, you should use there's a Q&A icon uh, in your Zoom settings. I believe it is on the left side of the, of the screen. And if you click on that Q&A button, yeah, you can then submit a question for us. So we will pause along the way for questions that you might have, um, and we'll pause at the end as well for any questions. Thanks so much. Uh, so you can hear me, right? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so thank you all for joining. My name is Paul Albert. Um, for the last couple years, I've been working with Tableau and at Tableau, helping people do more with their data. I've since retired and I do instruction to a number of graduate programs in the DC area. Um, my website is Visalist and you can reach me at paul at visalist.com. I know Debbie has a, for more questions slide at the end that has a slightly different email. This email will work. And um, in, re in addition to pointing out the recording that we're going to make of this webinar on my website. I'll also have the slides that I'm using in case you find them useful. So um, let me just go ahead and these are the things that I want to talk about in using averages and representing averages. Uh, three different stages. How are you calculating an average? Second stage, how are you interpreting it? And then finally, how are you reporting it? and representing it. Uh, we'll go over each one of these key takeaways as they come up in the presentation. But before we dive into the presentation, I wanted to bring up these two books, uh, The Truthful Art by Alberto Cairo. Um, it's a wonderful foundational understanding of not only statistics, but also how to use statistics for representation. On the right, you see statistics for people, parentheses, who think they hate statistics by Neil Salkin. Uh, it's a great introductory book into statistics. One of the things that Tableau does is it makes it very easy for people to try to visualize their data. 
But quite often what we have are people who have a lot of programmatic expertise in data. Uh, I'm sorry, a lot of programmatic expertise in what their data represents who might not have as much expertise in how to represent data or interpret data. So this presentation is hoping to bring both communities together, the community who really understands statistics and comes from a statistics background, and the community who might not be as well versed in statistics, but know what their program and their is trying to do with visual representations. So let me talk about my aha moment. And um, what I've done is I offer a power workshop in Learning Tableau. Uh, you can find the workbook for the, for the workshop on my website. Um, I'll be doing some videos that will be free on the website that go over this power start idea, how to use Tableau. It's a three hour course. And as homework for the course, what we ask is for students to take some data sets, build visualizations off of, the, off of them, publish them onto Tableau Public, and then send me the URL for comments. So I've done this about 68 times, or I've had about 68 different homework assignments sent to me. And these were graduate students, mostly in public affairs programs, who were very aware of the questions that needed to be asked. They were very aware of what the data was they were dealing with, but they weren't quite as aware of how to manipulate data or how to represent data. And what I found is of the 68 homework assignments, about half of them were actually calculating averages wrong. So that's the first point that I wanna talk about in today's presentation. Once you learn how to calculate an average correctly or understand how Tableau is calculating averages, the next question is how do you interpret averages and then how do you represent them? So this is um, our first section, problems in calculating averages. And this comes from Makeover Monday, um, which is a weekly uh, community event where online at makeovermonday.com.uk, I believe, uh, what they do is they publish a data set and they ask people to visualize that data. So roughly, you know, it could be up to 100 people that are going to pr provide visualizations. People share their visualizations over Twitter. And then at the end of the week, uh, they highlight the best visualizations as well as lessons learned in the visualizations. So for those of you who are not familiar with Makeover Monday, it's a great resource to use to practice your visualization chops. So this is the data set from week 21 of 2017. What it's doing is talking about survey responses to alcohol, to who drank alcohol and how often people are drinking alcohol. Not surprisingly, this was a popular topic to visualize among the college students that, that were doing homework assignments. And if you look at this data set, what we see is that each row is showing you a different year, and then a different age range, a gender, and then the question, did you drink alcohol in the last week? Or it could be, did you drink alcohol more than four times in the last week? And then the proportion of respondents for that category who responded, yes, they had drunk in alcohol, drank alcohol. Um, this is a sample visualization that was done by one of the students. Visually, it's quite attractive. She has a nice little icon of different types of drinks. Um, and what it's showing is alcohol consumption decreases by year. One of the things that I wanna show in this presentation is how easy it is to misunderstand what Tableau does in doing visualizations um, and draw the wrong conclusions, or draw conclusions that really couldn't be properly reached. So if we dive into this uh, workbook itself, we see that what she did, um, and it could have been a him as well, but in this case, it was a, it was a woman, uh, is look at the average proportion and then report that by year for specific questions. And again, if you look at the data set, you see if we take the average proportion, what we're going to do is, because we're doing it by year, we're not summing up the years, but we're going to be summing up the, all the different age ranges, all the different genders. And in fact, we also have a row record that's showing for all people. 
So if you look at the underlying workbook that went into this dashboard, this is exactly what this person is doing. It's saying, it's telling Tableau to take that proportion for those different categories and just average across them. The problem with this is that it could only be an accurate representation of the average if every single category was the same, if every single group of men 16 to 24 was the same number as group of women 16 to 24, and um, ideally you would filter out the all persons records because we're sort of triple counting here. But it's a, it's a mistake that can be made in Tableau and it's a mistake that can be made pretty easily. Uh, here we see the bar chart that went into the dashboard. And again, what's being done is just taking the average of the proportion values without really filtering out and understanding that there's different numbers or different bases of numbers that are going into that. So trying to summarize what this issue is, um, this is the biggest gotcha in calculating averages. So we have group one, it has 100 that are red, one out of 1,000. Group two, it has 80 that are red out of 100. We know that group one has 10% red, we know that group two has 80% red. Now the approach that was being done just now was to take the average of the averages. And that's telling us the percentage of red across the group. So if we just take the average of 10 and 80%, we get 45%. Um, the real approach or the real way to calculate the average across a population is to create a new average. So what we wanna do is take um, the sum of the people who are red divided by the sum of the population. And in this case, we find that it's only 16% who are red. Um, in this specific data set, you really weren't able to make those sort of comparisons because you really didn't know what the numerator and denominator were and the different proportions. Ideally, you're going to know this and be able to calculate it, but quite often you're going to run into a data set that poses these problems. My answer to that is that your visualization needs to recognize that these problems exist and not try to aggregate things that can't be properly aggregated. So the point number one is, takeaway point number one is to understand what your numerator and denominator are. And it seems like a simple point, but often it can get lost when you're working with any software platform, Tableau included. And to prove this point or to talk about this point, let's take a look at the Tableau Superstore data set. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, use a sample data set that ships with Tableau. I'm going to say connect to data and pull up my sample Superstore data set. For anybody in the audience who has Tableau on their desktops or, PC or workbook, desktops or machines, you're going to have this data set as well. So I just double click on it, pulling it up from my saved uh, data sources. And uh, let's talk about the data set really briefly. What this data set is, is a sample data set created by Tableau to help people understand how to work with measures, how to work with dimensions and measures more easily. I would be shocked if anybody in the audience actually was running an office superstore. But what I want to do is challenge you to understand that while the dimension names and while the measure names might not be the exactly what the dimension names and measure names you are working with, the way that Tableau works with these dimensions and measures are exactly the way that they're going to work with your data. Uh, the second point I'd like to make is that if you run into problems with Tableau and can't share your data, uh, I worked a lot with the federal government where they weren't able to share data. What you could do is just recreate your problem using the sample superstore data set and then go to Tableau uh, support or the Tableau community for help. Uh, one of my fun examples of doing this is I was working with a law enforcement organization that wanted to show seizures of particular drugs for one month versus a moving average of the last six months. What we did was put that in superstore terms and we looked at sales of furniture versus technology for this month versus the last six months. So superstore is a great data set to have at hand. It's a great data set for you to embrace. 
Um, and finally, Superstory is the lingua franca of Tableau. If you look at how people explain using Tableau, if you look at pe how people run into, um, show, show different ways of using data, using measures and dimensions, they often use the Superstore data set. So let me go ahead and um, say what we want to do is take a look at our profit by category. To do that, I'm going to drag category out to my uh, columns and Tableau analyzes my data set. It finds I have three categories, furniture, office supplies, and technology. Let me bump this up just a little bit so you can read all the labels. And uh, then I'm going to look at profit across the categories. And what Tableau has done is drawn a bar chart showing me what the sum of the profit for each category is. Since we're interested in looking at averages, one thing that people might just fall into is saying, let me change the measure type. And you could do that by right clicking on your pill and saying rather than the sum, I want the average. Let's go ahead and look at the average value. And people could call that a day. You know, say, okay, I've done this, um, and, and here is what my averages is. Averages are. Ha. Um, now, let's go beyond what, what Tableau is showing and ask, what is the numerator and denominator in this case? So what Tableau did when we said, just change your measure from the sum of profit to average of profits, is it took the sum of the profits and it divided it by the number of rows. Um, when we examine the data, and we can do that by calculate by opening this data window here, what we see is each record within our data set, but we find that for each record in the data set, the quantities are different. So on an extreme uh, side of the equation, we could have one record that shows 100 different pieces of technology bought and the profit for that, and another record that's showing one piece of furniture bought and the record for that. The way we're calculating average right now with Tableau, Tableau would take the sum of those profits and divide by two. That's not the numerator we want in this case. What we want to do is take the sum of the profit and we want to divide it by the sum of the quantity. So let's go ahead and create a calculation that does that. So I'm going to create calculated field. I'm going to call this my average calculated profit. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to use the expression editor to say take the sum of the profit and divide by the sum of the quantity. So that's the calculation we want. And in fact, if we take that calculation and we put it up um, to our rows to compare, we see that we have completely different numbers. That in fact, the actual average for technology, when you look at the sum of profits divided by the sum of quantities is 20.96 versus the $79. One of the things that really bums me out about the data set is that it's very likely or very possible that the shape of the bars, the relative shape of the bars, proportion of the bars could have changed dramatically. And we could have seen that technology actually has a much lower average price than office supplies, just depending on the shape of the data or the way the data is, is, is done. I think because this is synthetic data, you don't see as dramatic of a change as you would see um, with real data, but it, it's quite possible that in calculating this correctly, we would have seen a much larger bar for office supplies than relative to technology. So um, let's make this a little bit easier, and I'm going to format this number, the, the number for the average calculated profit, as currency with zero decimal places. So I do that by right-clicking on my pill, default properties, number format, 
currency custom, taking that down to zero. You know, just an, just an easier way to see that. And since we're calculating, um, since we see that we're calculating it correctly, I'm going to take my average profit pill and just drag it off the view in order to show us just the correct calculation. If I wanted to see across all of my uh, categories for everything, for every record, what the average calculated profit was, I could just go ahead and drag the calculated calculation we created out to text and see that the average calculated profit is in fact $8. Now I'm showing you that because I wanna compare that with another approach. And that's to um, use something called reference lines. Uh, Tableau offers an ability to supercharge your data analysis very, simple, very quickly by using reference lines. And in this case, what we wanna do is take an average line and we're going to go ahead and drag it out to our table. And I'm going to edit it. And a good practice is to show the aggregation you're doing along with the value. And we'll go take our reference line and say, show us the computation, then a colon, and then the value. And what we see is that Tableau, in fact, is showing us the average, but the average it's showing us is $10. It's not the $8 that we see is going across the entire data set. So why is Tableau doing this? Um, to help us understand that, I'm going to go here to the menu under Worksheet, click on Show Summary, and it's going to help us understand what we're seeing. And what you see is that the count here is three. This corresponds to the count that's being displayed here in the lower left of three marks. So when Tableau is pulling up this reference line, what it's doing is um, showing us that uh, between these three bars, the average is 10. So 2 plus 5 plus 21 divided by 3 is 10. Um, this isn't really what we want. What we want to do is look across the entire universe and show that it's $8. However, um, in our case, uh, to do that, would the easiest way to do that would be to do a level detail expression. I'm not going to do that now, but really the takeaway I want to I want you to get from this demonstration is how easy it is to slip into calculating the wrong numerator and denominator for the average you want. And it's not only true for averages; it's true for any ratios that you're going to try to calculate. It's often easy to have Tableau represent a value that really isn't the correct value that you ultimately want. So what I wanna urge everyone to do is as you're working with Tableau, as you're working with any software package, make sure that you understand what the numerator and denominator are and do as many cross checks as you can to, under, to make sure that you're presenting the best information possible before you present the information. Um, so let's continue back with the presentation. Uh, and um, the next point is problems in interpreting averages, but let me pause now and Debbie ask you, do we have any questions in the queue? Let me check, uh, no questions so far. Okay, perfect. So, uh, We've understood first that in calculating an average, what you want to do is look at the numerator and denominator, that it's often problematic to take an average of averages. But let's talk about problems in understanding our interpreting averages. So this is a famous uh, statistical data set. It's called Anscombe's Quartet. Francis Anscombe created this in 1973. And the point he was heading towards in the paper that created this is that people often just look at an average, or a mean in this case, 
and, and turn away and say, okay, my job is done. I've been able to describe the data. So what we have here are four different data sets, X and Y coordinates. For every single one of these data sets, X has the same mean, X has the same variance, Y has the same mean, and Y has the same variance. Uh, going further, they also all have the same exact linear regression line and the same exact R square of coefficient of determination. Now the problem with just using a number, an average, is that really an average is an expression of a central tendency of a number of, of a number of points. And really, rather than stopping with average, which what Francis Anscombe was urging people to do, is to look at how those averages are represented. So as you can see, when we plot each one of those four data sets, what we come up with is a radically different line. And if we were trying to make decisions based on those data sets, the decisions we would make would be much different than if we were just looking at the number or just considering the average as a concrete representation that we could build on. Uh, what I've done here is I've built a histogram. Uh, Tableau can do this out of the box. You drag a measure up to uh, one of your rows or columns, and you can use show me to develop a histogram. Uh, what it's going to do is create a bin of the measure that you're trying to uh, describe. Uh, top recommendations is don't use a bar chart for, for your histogram, use a line. And second is take your bin size down to one. But what you see in these histograms, and this is again the histograms from the Anscombe Quartet, is that they're very different in the distributions of values. Um, X1, data set X1, approaches a normal distribution. Data set X4 is very skewed to the left. So um, let's talk about uh, skewing and what does it mean to use an average when you're talking about skewed populations. And this was talked about by Alberto Cairo in the book that I referenced earlier. Um, it's a well-known uh, data problem that people talk about in calculating averages. So let's say, for example, that across the country, the average salary for geography majors is $50,000. However, in 1986, for the class of 1986, for University of North Carolina, the average geography graduate earned over a million dollars. Would that make you want to switch schools? Um, before you answer, let's consider what did the population look like? And we find that in fact, Michael Jordan was a geography major in University of North Carolina who graduated in 1986. And what he has done is he has completely taken the mean this one outlier has moved our mean dramatically to the right. This is a problem that you run into when your averages are, when your data set is highly skewed. And honestly, a lot of data sets in reality are highly skewed. So rather than the mean, probably it would make more sense in this, in this um, context to look at the median. You know, if you took 50% of the population and said, at, at that point, what are they earning? And then you had another 50%, what you'd be asking is, what does the average person earn, not what is the average earnings per person? This point's underscored, uh, and again, you'll see I use uh, Alberto Cairo a lot in this presentation, but he quoted uh, Erickson and Nosenchuk. Uh, in an article saying you shouldn't focus on how much people earn on average, but how much the average person earns. So when you run into a highly skewed data set, I'd urge you to use the median rather than the average. In fact, according to statisticians, the median is also an average. So the average, what Excel calls an average, which Tableau calls an average, which many people think about when they say average, is really the arithmetic mean, um, but a median or uh, even a mode are also considered averages. 
to a statistician, the formal definition of an average is a measure of central tendency. So, Alfred Whitehead um, in the early 1900s uh, came up with uh, some real, some interesting understanding about how science is done. And his guiding principle was seek simplicity, but don't distrust it. And he came up with something called a fallacy of concrete representativeness. I know it doesn't roll off the tongue, but what he was talking about is a tendency of people to take an abstraction and treat that abstraction as if that was a reality. A uh, famous example of that would be considering the map as a reality rather than the territory that it's trying to represent. In this case, what I'd urge people to do is understand that the average is just a number. It's a number that's trying to show central tendency. It's not a number that in itself should be relied on. So that's takeaway number two, is understanding the shape of the data is just as important as understanding the average of the data. And luckily, Tableau, uh, Tableau's slogan is help people see and understand their data. By seeing the data, you're often able to understand it much more easily. So um, what I wanna do now is talk a little bit about um, some of the problems with averages or some of the problems with how things can happen just by probability. This is called a Galton probability box. And what people would do is build this box. Each one of these pins is equidistance. It looks like a pachinko uh, machine. So when you drop the marble, it's going to hit a pin, either go left or right, hit another pin, either go left or right, hit another pin, either go left or right, and, and go on. So what we're, and, and so on. So what we're doing, is we're working around something called the law of large numbers that as large amounts of observations are seen, they tend to generate what's called a uniform distribution. And Alberto Cairo uh, points out this great YouTube visualization where you can see the marbles being dropped and you can see where they settle. And in fact, we see something called a uniform distribution. It makes sense that when you're looking at the probability of going left or right of every pen, you're going to see greater concentrations in the middle and it's going to have tails on both ends. But the point that I'd like to make is um, that intrinsic to probability is that as you get to the tail, you're going to see different representations or more variability within how things are represented. So in fact, over here on the right, we see mostly white marbles. Here on the left, we see mostly dark marbles. Now, what can that mean? What can that mean as we try to understand averages? Uh, consider this. This is the distribution of school sizes and test scores in North Carolina. We're staying in North Carolina. And uh, if you look at the smallest decile, the smallest tenth of school sizes, 27% of them were in the top 25 schools from 97 to 2000. Um, and if you just look at this number, what you can assume is that the smaller the school size, the more likely you are to have better test scores. And in fact, uh, the Gates Foundation took a look at this and they spent more than $2 billion on an effort to build smaller schools and a smaller school initiative. And what they found is that they weren't getting quite the response that they wanted or they weren't getting the uh, effects that they wanted by focusing on smaller schools. And the reason why becomes a lot more apparent when you look at not just part of the data, not just data represented in a certain way, but you look at the full data. So like the marbles we were just looking at, yes, the smaller school sizes tended to do better than the larger school sizes, but the smaller school sizes also tended to do worse. On average, the school sizes, the, the, the differences in both variations tended to cancel themselves out 
and smaller school sizes on average tended to do about the same as larger school sizes. So um, this is just a quick example of how not understanding what you're looking at, not understanding that I'm just looking at one part of the distribution can lead to dramatically bad results. Um, so takeaway point number three is that the smallest groups are always going to show this, this greatest variance. Before we move on to representing averages, uh, let me ask Debbie, are, are there any questions in the queue? Uh, no questions again. Uh, as a reminder to our participants, if you'd like to submit a question, you can do so through the Q&A button. I believe it is on the left side of your screen. Um, please do that anytime and we will be glad to address them. But no questions for now, Paul. Perfect. Okay, well, let's, um, Let's look at representing averages. So um, this is a bar chart. It's showing what average water level would be. Um, I have two points on the bar chart, or two points on the viz. One is at point A above the bar, and one is point B below the top of the bar. We're going to do an experiment and try to do a poll of the audience to say, what do you think is more likely to occur? point A or point B? Let me give the audience a little time to answer and Debbie ask you to uh, summarize when we get the answers. Great. I have just launched the poll, so if you are tuned in, you should see a little window pop up on your screen and the poll will have just one question. It says, which is more likely to occur, point A or point B? Uh, I see that a couple people are taking a peek here, getting some results. I'll give you 30 more seconds uh, to submit your response. Go ahead and pick either point A or point B. Okay, so uh, Paul, uh, drum roll here for the results in terms of what we have. Uh, we actually have a hundred percent of the participants vote for point B as being more likely to occur. Fantastic, because that's proving exactly what I wanted to demonstrate. Um, if you remember, when we look at averages, they're always in a uniform, well, they're not always in a uniform distribution, but they're in a distribution. And in fact, what we see is point A is closer to the average than point B. So if the average water level by region followed a uniform distribution, then point A is actually more likely to occur. But the reason I'm really, I asked to do this, Paul, and I wanted to talk about this is to demonstrate that bar charts in themselves are a visual cue to people. People look at a bar chart and say, that's a concrete number. And then when you ask them what's more likely to occur, they look and they think that things that are inside the bar chart are more likely to occur than things outside the bar chart. So um, this is uh, a seminal article that was done by George Newman, Brian Scholl, these are experimental economists. And what they do is they will take, um, they will take different things and actually poll communities. And based on um, a few hundred uh, experiments, what they found is that people think things are more likely to occur inside the bar than outside the bar. And they call that the within the bar bias. And I guess the point for us as data visualists, uh, people who are trying to visualize data and help people get the correct, um, the correct understanding of what the data shows is that when we're trying to show there's a central tendency by a mean, showing it as a bar chart makes people think that things are going to happen within that bar, that, that our results really aren't distributed well. 
Uh, and I don't know whether it was this exam. I don't know whether they uh, got this example, but uh, we'll, we'll look at something that happened at Red River Valley, Valley in a second. Uh, what I would suggest is rather than going from a bar chart, which by the way is Tableau's default for when you're showing one measure, uh, you could get dramatically different understandings and dramatically different better decision making based on visualizations by showing them as dots. So I simply took my bars, changed them to dots, and then I, um, in the example on the right, what I did is I bumped up my uh, y-axis to show a little bit more space over the west. And in fact, when you do experiments, you find that people are, when, you, when you're looking at those two-point comparisons, they're more likely to say that the closer something is to the circle, the more likely it is to the curve. And that's just a quick way to get rid of this within the bar bias. Um, now, this might or might not have happened because of a bar chart, but in fact, in 1997, based on an average of river, the, an average put out by the U.S. Weather Service that the Red River crests at 49 feet on average, uh, the p officials uh, made a flood management plan based simply on that average. But in fact, as averages are just measures of central tendency, it was only a matter of time before a flood crest was above that average. And in fact, when this happened in 1997, it went to 50 feet and more than 50,000 people were forced from their homes. So there's very real impact from how we represent averages, how we show averages and how we understand averages to how people foreign policies. Um, Sam Savage wrote this in an article in the Harvard Business Review, The Flaw of Averages. Uh, he also has a great book called The Flaw of Averages. So takeaway point number four, beware of using bar charts to represent averages. If we're talking about a measure of central tendency, what we want to do is show the population as a whole and how that average focuses on that population. So what are averages good for? Um, because I think they're good, and what I want to do is show you some examples of visualizations where I think that they've been used very effectively. And I would argue that in all of these examples, rather than a concrete number that you just go and take away, the averages are being used to anchor comparisons. Um, and this is um, a great article. Michael Correll has done a lot of research and writing into how to understand averages, how to understand that you're just looking at a measure of central tendency. And he starts off with something called error bars on the left, which is a common scientific practice where you do one standard deviation above and below the average in order to show uh, where the numbers might lie. Uh, he found that wasn't particularly effective uh, and proposed, tested a couple of other different approaches. Uh, this is the box plot. Uh, Tableau ships with the ability to do a box plot very easily, something called a gradient plot and something called a violin plot. And all these are meant to help you understand how your central measure of central tendency might differ across the entire population. Uh, it might be my background, where I'm from. I'm more from the public policy uh, arena. And honestly, I really rarely see visualizations that use box plots, almost never see visualizations that use violin plots, and have never seen a visualization that uses a gradient plot. But the key takeaway from this is trying to show the mean in context leads to better decisions and to better understanding than showing the mean alone. So here are some really interesting ways of showing means. Uh, this is mentioned by Alberto Cairo in his book. Uh, LA Times did a visualization about the evolving elements of pop music. And you see what we're doing is we're getting close to what that violin plot looked like. So the size of the circles increase the nearer that they get to uh, the average. And um, what he's done, the authors have done, is colored the 
circles the dots above the average green and colored the circles below the average gray. And I think this is, does a really good job of showing the variability of the different measures. So you understand I'm looking at an average, I'm looking at an average and how it moves over time, but I'm looking at an average in context of the entire data set that was being used to evaluate the average. If I had to criticize this visualization, I would say that um, because we have so much space above the average and so little space below the average, we might not be doing the best job we can to show that there's actually probably an equal number, about an equal number of dots below as above. Um, and that's just the fact that it's bounded by the zero. It's, it's the way the visualization is built. But nonetheless, I think it's a visualization that's going in the great, a great direction. So here it is um, on the website. What we just showed was the key to interpreting the results. And the last point of information they gave is what was the year with the highest average. If you highlight any of the circles, it'll talk about a song and where it fits with the average or where it fits with the direction. Uh, this is a moving average, uh, and it's using something called Bollinger Bands. Uh, there's a number of great blogs out there on how to create Bollinger Bands in Tableau. But rather than just showing the line, what it's also doing is showing the deviation that can be within the line for each one of the points. And it's helping you interpret the fact that while there is a line, don't treat it, the line just as a concrete representation. Treat the line as something that's part of a greater whole. So a, a great example of using Bollinger Bands. Uh, this is an example of using a uh, moving average. So what we see is uh, real population spikes. Uh, the population who are enrolled in Social Security, that's the spiky line and then a moving average that's put on top of it that helps us understand better the shape of the data. Now, this is interesting. Um, I've never thought of doing this, but I think it makes a lot of sense, is showing departures from the moving average to really show when things are going up dramatically or going down dramatically. So again, what we're using the average for here is not as an absolute point, but as a reference point. And against that reference point, we're showing the movement of uh, whatever measure it is that's being depicted in the chart. It's, it's not the same as the last chart. And then finally, um, another uh, visualization from Alberto Cairo. What I really like about the visualization is all the different ways that averages are being used. So we're looking at a seasonal subseries each one of the, the lines is summing up for a number of years and averaging what that variation was. So this line is an average. And against the line, what he's showing is the average for the month for the number of years. And then finally, with the dotted line, what he's showing is the average for all years. Just a really interesting way of using averages to help better understand what the shape of the data is without using an average as just a concrete representation saying, this is it, use this to base your decision on. So takeaway point number five is averages are great to anchor comparisons. So with that, let me go turn back to uh, Tableau uh, Superstore, and I see that we have uh, three minutes to our time. I'm going to go through the, the next part. I'm, I'm looking at maybe another 10 minutes or so, so I apologize to people that we might run over. We, we started a little bit late, but uh, let's start by taking our sheet, and I'm just going to duplicate it. And we know that we don't want to show the average as a bar chart because people are going to think it falls within the bar much more than they think that it will fall outside the bar. And I'm going to change that to show a circle or a dot. And I'll just go to circle. So 
right now we've got a better way of showing an average. Uh, as I stated before, probably we'd want to bump up our y-axis to show a little bit above the 21 or 22 where it cuts off to visually signify to people, hey, it could go a lot lower than this. We also might want to show some negative numbers to show that it could actually go into the negative. Um, now, by default, what Tableau does when it visualizes data is it aggregates the data. So it's going to take all of our different measures and come up with one number or one different mark for them. So in this case, we have a count of three different marks, and we see the count about down here on the left and the up in the upper right here in the summary card, if I just go to analysis and uncheck aggregate measures, we're going to go from that count of three to a count of 9,994. If I go to my view data, you'll see that we have 9,994 different rows. So what we're getting is a dot for each row. Let's see if we can make this a little bit more visually informative for people. So first thing I'm going to do is take my size and bump that down. Uh, I don't want to label for the dots, so I'm going to unclick my hide mark. I'm going to unclick the mark labels. And then what we're going to do is, this is called dithering. Uh, we're going to play with the colors a little bit. In this case, I'm going to take the color and bump it down to 24%. So now we're showing a lot more visually how to compare the different, uh, how, how our central tendency falls within the overall data set. Just as a side note, if you're working with a map that has lots of dots, um, the great way to show dots that are lying on each, on top of each other is to take your transparency opacity way down and then to give them a border. And it's a great way of um, helping to highlight, helping the dots pop. In this case, we're not going to have a border. We're just going to leave it like this. Um, so now we have a start. Um, one of the things that I want to do is now show what the average is for each one of the technologies. I could do that by dragging out a new reference line from the analytics tab, but let me just go ahead and edit this. And what I'm going to do is ask it, instead of doing this for the entire table, do it on a per cell basis. Let's look at what that looks like. And then we're going to say, okay, so, our average numbers, let me show you again, our average numbers are going into our bars. It's a little hard to understand what's being shown. I'm going to change this again, and I'm going to make my line, a dotted line, make it pretty darn small, and make it less black. I know I'm doing a lot. And instead of showing the computation and value, I want to show just the value itself. So now we're showing uh, the average value for each one of the technology, for each one of the categories. <laughs> and the problem that I would say with this visualization is that the range is so large, particularly for technology, what we're doing is we're drowning out a visual comparison between the two averages. So let's go ahead and fix that. And uh, as a good step to do that, uh, what I'm going to do is take my y-axis and rather than having it start at the where the data set starts and where the data set ends, I'm going to constrain it. Actually, let me go to 200. I'm going to constrain it to uh, 200. Minus 200 and plus 200. And again, the reason we're doing this is to help people visually see what the difference between the averages is. Now, as someone who always likes to show as much data as possible, someone might say, hey, this is, this is a little problematic. You're not showing all the data. What I would argue is by simplifying, by excluding some of the data, what we're showing is a richer chart or richer information that people can make better decisions on. 
since we have the summary card up, one of the things we can do is just highlight the, the dots that are visible. And we're going to see that our summary card tells us, in fact, we have 99.2% of all the records being shown in this visualization, uh, which is pretty good. I mean, what we might want to do is even to constrain the axes even more. But in this case, what I want to do is make the visualization a little bit more compelling. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is go to format, go to my grid lines, and say for my rows, I don't want any grid lines. So I'm going to remove all of these grid lines. Let me show you what I did. I went from those grid lines to this. And then um, I have my reference lines, you know, not too dominant, but I think my value lines are fairly dominant. So I'll right click on my value format and I'll say what I want to do is make that a little less dark. And I think we're running into a nice, a nice visualization for the data. And what's good about this is we built a really good base that we can do further comparisons on. So for example, if what I wanted to do is look at how the categories behaved across the different regions, I could just drag region out to the line, out to my column, and then be able to compare for the different regions, not only what the average profit was per category, but help people see visually how the range was for each one of these. And to make it a truly compelling visualization, let me change my title to average profit by category. And I'm going to let people know that only 99% of records shown. So if someone was very interested in outliers, they would know, okay, we're, we're only showing 99% of our records, hit apply, and that's the final visualization that I would recommend to, uh, to help show not only what our average is for profit in this case, but how that average fits with the overall data set. So with that, let me turn back to our key takeaways uh, in calculating an average, always understand what your numerator and denominator are. Don't try to take averages of averages. In interpreting your average, understand the shape of the data is just as important as understanding the average of the data. Uh, and also the smallest groups will always show the greatest variance. In representing the data, Beware of using bar charts to represent averages or any ratio. And also averages are great to anchor comparisons. So that's the, the, what I had prepared. Um, let me open it up for questions if there are any, Debbie. Awesome. Uh, let's see, let me open up our question panel here. Um, let's see, no questions, uh, but I did notice that a couple people did drop maybe because of, uh, we just ran up against time. Um, so if I'll, I'll give people a few more seconds to submit any questions uh, at all, if any. Um, if you don't think of any, if anyone on the line does not think of any questions, uh, this presentation is recorded. So you will have a chance to go back, uh, take a look at some of the content. Again, we will post this on the Meetup page. And as Paul mentioned, he can post it on his site as well. All right. Um, all right, so still no questions. Um, Paul, any last takeaways that you might have? Otherwise, we can close out the webinar. No, I want to thank uh, Interworks for this opportunity, Tableau and, and the audience for participating. A good visualization is a visualization meant to change somebody's mind, to inform them or help them make a better, better decision. As you try to build these good visualizations, I urge you to look at what you're doing when you're calculating averages, interpreting them and representing them. 
Thanks so much, Paul. And thanks everyone for taking the time to dial in and we will see you again soon at another meetup, uh, whether in person or webinar and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone.